You're listening to Releasing Trauma, a survivor's podcast. And now here's your host, Tracy Osborne. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the show. Today, we're talking about how you have to go through pain in order to grow. And that really sucks, but that's just kind of how life is. And joining me today is Hilda Manuel Dixon. And, you know, she, like all of us, has had her own painful challenges and, and times that she's had to get through in order to grow and become who she is today. So, Hilda, welcome to the show. Thank you. Well, I'm I'm excited to have you here, um, and I'm thrilled to to be able to talk to you and and you know share a little bit about your story and um, you know help our listeners get through this this growing pains that we have to go through. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, so you know, if you could start out, uh, just tell us a little bit about your your life story or your backstory. Okay, I think it's best I walk with a portion of my story. My yeah. life story will keep us here for several hours. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think it's best I focus on the aspect, which um, today I've turned into another ministry, I'll say. So um, about 20 years ago, um, I got married, hoping to start having children after about a year. But that took us almost five years. So there was some infertility issue for the period while um, I waited. So, and and while going through the infertility journey, coincidentally, the doctor we had seen had um, told us clearly as a couple that it's impossible for us to have a child naturally. And um, he had gone on to say, We had to go through a specific treatment. Um, It has to be either ICSI or nothing, and IVF wouldn't work or any of the other methods. So, well, I would say I'm supernaturally by divine intervention. I was able to conceive barely um, a month or two after the doctor told me it was impossible. You know, with no intervention whatsoever, I conceived. So it only came naturally that I named the child um, on CME, which um, means nothing is impossible with God because the doctor was quite blunt. It's impossible, you know. So down the line, at about 18 months, she comes home feeling sick and or working in a funny way. And I'm wondering, why are you working this way? Because I conceived, I had her. She was this cheerful, young, vibrant lady. Uh, or let me call her a young child, <laughs> very vibrant though. So she came home walking in a funny way and trying to find out what was going on. You know, did you fall down? She said, no, what exactly happened? She didn't really have a story for us. We did a follow up with the daycare where she was. Nothing strange happened. Nobody knew what was going on. Well, fast forward to a uh, month later, because we kept moving from one house hospital to the other, trying to know exactly what the problem was. And um, at about 21 months, which was three months after we started the whole search, she was diagnosed with um, neuroblastoma stage four. So that was childhood cancer hitting her, hitting her right even after waiting that long to have this precious baby. So that was really the, that's my little story. And um I would say from there, um, so much has come out of it. You know, when you talk of pain for growth, it all started from there. Waiting, being joyous, it's all good, you know, like you're in a lovely love, um, you're in a love affair with this baby. And soon, sooner, sooner than you think, you're struggling to actually take care of this baby, battling her life, or rather battling for life and dealing with cancer. So that was it in a nutshell. I I can't even imagine what that was like. Um, you know, I just babies should not get cancer. That that's just one of those things that just should not happen. <coughs> um, you know, and as mamas, 
we want what's best for our babies and we want to fix everything, you know, put a bandaid on all the boo-boos and, and just make it all better. And when it's something that, that serious, um, I think it makes us feel helpless as moms. Did you have that feeling of helplessness? Oh, I did. You know, I really felt helpless. You know, it started off with trying to get the diagnosis right. It took forever. We didn't know what was going on. In fact, we didn't get the diagnosis um, in the country where we reside, which is Nigeria. We couldn't get the diagnosis. So we went round and round. So you can imagine going through all of that. I was sure. I felt helpless even before the diagnosis eventually came up because, you know, I was just itching. I wanted to know what the problem was so that I could channel my efforts properly. And, you know, seeing a child exhibiting all the symptoms and as a mom, there was only so much I could do at the time other than pray, hold on to God and just hope that they'll get to the bottom of it and we'll be able to know what the next steps were. So, yes, as a mother, when you're surrounded with, or your child has such terrible pain and you really can't nip it at the board. I mean, you feel helpless. So naturally I did feel helpless. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you know, with my girls, I've never gone through anything quite so serious, but with the, you know, various odds and ends that we've been through over the years, um, you know, I've had plenty of those, those periods of feeling helpless watching, you know, just watching them, heal from whatever it is they're healing from and they're they're not being anything really that I can do um it's hard it's it really is um you know at what point did you know things change for you and and you go from a feeling of helplessness to um you know uh I guess hopeful Okay, um, I'll, I'll like to see it as a process. Yeah. It took a process, but it was um, in quick, in quick um, successions because by the time I traveled with her from Nigeria to the U.S., within two days of getting into the U.S., I had a diagnosis and I had a treatment plan. So, of course, when I was told it was cancer, I broke down. I cried, you know, I couldn't, I'd never heard of children having cancer, truth be told. Mm -hmm. I'd always seen it as something that adults had to deal with or dealt with, but sparingly. I didn't know it was that common. And so I never really saw it coming for a child. So when it's, when I was told, it really hit me, you know, and um, but I indulged my emotions. I cried as much as I wanted to cry. You know, I prayed. There's just one question I didn't ask myself. I'm not sure how I did it, but I didn't bother asking why me. You know, oh. because you hear cancer, and you can't even think of an enemy you want to pass it on to. So that was it for me. But I'm a very positive person. And um, I guess life's experiences has kept me really positive. And I'm a woman of faith. So after the crying, I had to grab myself immediately because I realized there was work ahead and I needed to brace up. So as sad as it was, I had to embrace the treatment option. Thankfully, I had my brother with me in the US at the time. So he was able to support us through the process. So when I got everything laid out, marshaled out what the treatment plans were, at that point, I really just started, I'll say, rebuilding my faith. I just started focusing more on God. I started seeing the end as being bright and beautiful. I started um, doing a lot of, I continued to do the praying as much as I could, listen to positive music, I just kept on trying to, I was always around the corridor, smiling, acting like everything was okay, because I got to the point where I realized there was nothing I could do on my own, and I needed to trust God completely. 
So that was exactly how I went about it. And um, but somehow when we had gone way into the treatment, because coincidentally, when she was diagnosed with cancer, I was six months pregnant with my second child. So I was dealing with a child dealing with I had a child dealing with cancer. I was pregnant. So it was really, really stressful on both sides. But towards the end of the treatment, just about the transplant, it was a bit overwhelming for me. It was more like too much happening at the same time. And I needed something. I needed something to hold on to. I needed, because throughout the time, I had fed myself a lot of positive things. But at this point, I needed a real life experience. I needed someone to share what their journey was like, how they were able to hold it together through it all. And I didn't quite see people or I didn't quite get stories that showed vulnerability. So at that point, I was introduced to a support group. And though I went to the support group hoping to get help, hoping to get comfort, hoping to hear real life stories, but I wanted positive real life stories. Sadly, a lot of the parents we had on the support group had either had children that suffered relapse or had children that they had lost to cancer. So rather than give me the strength I required at that time, it more or less drained me. You know, the negative emotions started coming up and I started losing sleep. So it was at that point I disconnected from the group and I just started all over again to feed myself with really positive things, hooking up to um, programs where people were sharing their testimonies, positive things. You know, I just surrounded myself. I was listening to podcasts even as far back as um, 2008 when this was. I was just trying to make sure I fed my soul with the right dose of good um information. So that was when I actually made a vow that when I go through this journey, I just was just more like a vow to God to say, do this for me, take me through this successfully, and I will document it, put it together in a book so that many others can read it and draw hope and be encouraged through their journey of trials. So, I love, I, I love that. Yeah. I love that. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you, you can't find the support that you need. So you have to create the support that you need exactly. and, and kind of be your own support system. I kind of went through that when my husband died a couple of years ago, I joined uh, some widow groups and while they were helpful in the very beginning, um, as I began to heal, I was healing at a much different rate than a lot of the people in the group. And, you know, so they were, they were also very negative, um, very much stuck in their grief. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to move past that. And it was, it was holding me back. And I had to leave the support groups as well. um, Mm -hmm. In order for me to to be able to garner the strength and healing that I needed to get through that, that time. Um, You know, so sometimes that's what we have to do. We, we have to be our own cheerleaders um, and our, our own support systems sometimes. But what I really like about your story, Hilda, is that you never once said, why me? Because so many of us would fall down that rabbit hole of why me, why me? And, you know, into that almost victim mentality. Yeah. Uh, Was it your, you know, just the fact that you were so positive um, all the time before this happened, um, as well as your, your spirituality, your relationship with God, is that what kept you from going down that path? I wish I could say I was certain what kept me from going that path. But you know how you have something so horrible coming your way or something you perceive to be horrible coming your way. And as a lover of human beings, you can't even wish or move it to another human being because I can't think of anyone deserving of that route. 
So I don't think it's something I was so intentional about to say, I wouldn't say why me, but I just couldn't find who to touch the button to. So I had to own the button and see myself and see it as an honor, you know, to carry mm-hmm. that button. It wasn't an intentional, yes, I'm a very positive person. Yes, I always, I mean, even the worst situations, things people think one just would not come out of, I would give it a try. I wasn't always like that, but I'll say my mom helped me a lot because at some point I was always a very anxious child. I always wanted things to happen real quick. You know, I just wanted things to keep moving. But most times I go and I rant and rant and rant. And all I hear is, hey, it could be worse. So when you keep getting, it could be worse. It could be worse. I advised myself. I said, okay, I might as well stop talking. So I think with that, I, that positivity welled up within me. And having my partnership with God and knowing all his promises, and knowing that his plans for me are always good, even if they don't swing the way I expect them to. I knew that there was something in all of this for me. What it was, I wasn't sure. I wasn't even about to look or try to analyze the situation. I was just ready to let go and let God. That was where I found myself. Yeah, but it was too horrible an experience for me to say I want to move it to some other person. So right. I had to pause. Yeah. Um, so how did you use uh, you know, the pain from that that time to, you know, how did you I guess transform it from pain to growth? Yes. So um while it takes from pain to growth is um Yes, I went through the pain and I had lessons I learned while going through the pain. And I had things that helped me cope while going through the pain. So, um, I mean, seeing a problem and stepping in to be a solution or one of the solutions for me, it's one step of growth already. So documenting it in a book as well, Mm -hmm. where I, I was able to share my my coping um, strategy, I was able to sh- share about how, you know, encourage people to always stay positive. And even when things are going so well, you know, to fill themselves up with the word, encourage people to be open, encourage them, you know, when you want to trust, you trust completely. So the growth aspect is, I went through that process Some things worked for me that made the journey easier. I documented the whole painful process. I documented the aspects, you know, the the things I learned from there. And not just that. Today, it's the basis in which I'm able to boldly talk to people. You know, you said something about going through a painful time, you know, when you lost your spouse. Mm -hmm. And... uh, trying to get help at that time or rather get a support system and excusing yourself. But today, looking at your podcast, what are you doing? You're reaching out to those that are hurting and you're trying to get them on the right path. And for me, that's growth. So it's very similar to what I've done here by documenting it, telling people, sharing all my, uh, at least a few, all the tips I could remember that I used and making people stay hopeful and staying strong, even when the journey is overwhelming. And the aspect I want to interpret as growing as well is beyond sharing this, the book, 100% of the profit from the sale of the book already goes towards supporting pediatric and youth cancer causes. So that for me is using a painful situation to propel me to be a help or to be an extension, you know, of God's hands to others. So yes, that is growth for me. And after going through that experience or through that challenge for us as a family, it doesn't mean things have ceased or it doesn't mean that or the challenges have stopped coming away. However, we are, I would say we're kind of charged up to know that no matter what comes our way, 
we can go through with God's help. So it's helped us mature, it's helped us grow, it's helped us be helpful to others that are going through similar parts. And even through that, my daughter that is a cancer survivor was even able to start a foundation. I mean, just reading the draft of the book, she started a foundation and that's really the foundation, the primary foundation that we're supporting even through the book to reach out to people dealing with the same thing. I love it. I love it. And and you're right. You know, I think, um, you know, for a lot of us who have been through some kind of trauma, some kind of pain, being able to reach out and support others is very healing for us and very, um, you know, very, uh, I want to say growing, but that's just not the right way I want to phrase it. But, you know, it's, it's a, it helps us to grow is, is who we are. And, you know, so whether it's, it's, you know, having my podcast or you writing your book, creating the foundation, that is a form of, you know, being able to heal and being able to, um, you know, just help others who've been in that same situation and may not know where to turn or where to go. So I, I, you know, I, I completely agree agree with um, what you're saying in the path that you took. Uh, I think that's definitely the, the the path to healing and the path to growth. And also, you know, when we go through that pain, I think that prepares us in a way for future challenges that we may have to go through. Yes, I totally agree with you because um that's why I said if I tell my whole life story, it would take forever. So I rather <laughs> choose the question because I had gone through all the challenges, you know, earlier in life. And um, in retrospect, I could say that those challenges prepared me for what I had ahead of me, the same way this still prepares me for what I still have ahead of me, right? So, yes, um, I see the challenges bring you, they take you through a part of self discovery. And What that does for me as an individual is each time I find a turbulent situation in front of me, I just cast my mind back on what I've been through, how I dealt with it, what worked for me. And based on that, I'm able to do some form of recalibration. And it helps me just pick myself up and, you know, hope for the best. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Hilda, thank you so much for coming on the show today and talking with me about, you know, about your um, your story and your book and, and helping us to just remember that, you know, we're not alone out there. And no matter what we're going through, um, you know, there's hope and there's there's help. There's somebody out there who has been through uh, something similar than that what we're going through now. So um, I really appreciate you you taking the time and coming on the show. Um, tell you. us again the name of your book. It's it's the name of your daughter, correct? Yes, it's the it's a middle name on C M E. Yeah, so it's spelled it's very pretty. <laughs> it's I just don't want to butcher it. <laughs> yeah, it's spelled O S U N Y. A M E Y E. So it's on C M E. Yeah. But even if you search on Amazon with just Hilda Manuel Dixon, it would pop up. <laughs> right, right. Um, so listeners, you know, make sure you grab a copy of her book. Uh, and it's available, I'm sure, everywhere that you can get um, your books. Um, I will have the title and, every, and the link and everything in the show notes for you. Uh, you can also, you know, just go to Amazon or whatever and put in um, Hilda Manio Dixon, and I'm sure it will come up that way as well. And I will have um, Hilda's website also, glidewithhmd.com, listed in the show notes for you. So be sure you reach out to her if you are going through something similar and, you know, you need some support or you just want to share your story with her or whatever. So thank you for listening. And again, Hilda, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, Tracy. The pleasure was mine. And listeners, we'll talk to you in the next show. 
Thanks for tuning in. Be sure you hit subscribe on your favorite podcast platform so you don't miss a show. Be sure to check us out on our new socials on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. 